Al Jazeera podcast. The Boycott Israel movement has seen a huge surge in global support. The Palestinian-led movement has been calling for pressure on companies that profit from Israel's occupation. But in the U.S., its supporters are finding a shifting legal landscape. Anti-boycott legislation is now on the books in 37 states, in a country where boycotts are central to its past. We, our government, of the city, the county, or the state, are not going to do any business with you, a company, if you are part of the BDS movement. We are now seeing a challenge to this core right to protest in America. So what does it mean for Americans' everyday lives? I'm Malika Bilal, and this is The Take. My name is Julia Basha. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I do my documentary work through the media nonprofit Just Vision. Julia and her team have been making documentary films about Israel and Palestine for almost 20 years now. And these past months have been a very painful period for them. We have colleagues in Gaza right now, uh, in Tel Aviv and Ramallah, in Haifa and in Jerusalem. And those are people that I've been working with for two decades. One of the first people that we interviewed for Just Vision was a woman called Vivian Schiller, and she died on October 7 during the Hamas attacks in southern Israel. So let's talk about your latest work, a documentary called Boycott. And the film centers around laws in the U.S. that prohibit boycotting the state of Israel. And you focus on three stories specifically. One of those is the story of a Palestinian-American woman named Bahia Amawi. She's in the state of Texas. What can you tell us about Bahia? Bahia is a childhood speech pathologist, which means that she works in the Texas public school systems, helping students who have a variety of challenges uh, and learning disabilities related to speech. As far as I know, I'm the only speech language pathologist that speaks Arabic in the surrounding Austin area. They're losing an important service that's not available otherwise. I feel like I am letting down my community. So Bahia Maui has been renewing her contracts in the public um, education system for many years. And uh, a few years ago, she received uh, her contract with a new clause. That clause said that in order to continue serving the student population of Texas with her speech pathology services, she had to promise that she would not boycott Israel. Huh. If she refused to sign it, she was told she was fired from her job. Which would mean the loss of her livelihood, a choice other Americans like her are increasingly being forced to take. So Bahia went to her supervisors, who were just as shocked at this contract clause as she was, and shocked that they would have to enforce it. So to me, it's just nothing made sense at all of this. And it was a violation of everything, violation of my first, my freedom of speech, um, right to protest, my constitutional right. And so it was actually a no-brainer. In the end, Bahia decided not to sign the contract. A Palestinian-American teacher in Austin, Texas, has filed a federal lawsuit for losing her job as a speech pathologist after refusing to sign a pro-Israel oath. And um, she felt quite torn because that meant that her students didn't have a critical service that they needed. But she felt that she would not be able to tell her children that in America, you can have your opinion and you can hold political positions that are in disagreement with the government. And the government, theoretically in America, does not have the power to condition your job based on political viewpoints. This is against my principles, against my constitutional rights, and and it's also against my moral and ethical values, considering that I am a Palestinian-American, and I have family that actually live in occupied territory, so it affects me personally as well. So it affects me in both ways as an American citizen and as a Palestinian-American, too. 
So she sued the state of Texas to protect the constitutional rights of all Americans. So you mentioned that she and and her team were shocked at this. And I think a lot of our listeners will be, especially those who have not been as keyed in to similar laws like this sweeping the country. What in the world does a school district in Texas have to do with what's happening in Israel? How are those two things even connected? Yeah, and as you mentioned, Malika, the vast majority of Americans still have no idea these laws are on the books. Boycotts are a form of political expression and political organizing that have been at the core of the very foundation of America. From the American Revolution to the civil rights movement to consumer boycotts, a call to action seems to be an American tradition. The Boston Tea Party is at the core of the foundation of the United States. One of the events that holds extreme significance in America's quest for liberation from Britain occurred in Boston, colonial Massachusetts, known as the Boston Tea Party. Boycotts have since been used by social justice movements ranging from the civil rights era in America with the bus boycott that really is one of the the most celebrated social justice organizing movements in schools across the country. And Julia points out that the right to boycott has been upheld in court too, most recently in 1982. The Supreme Court voted unanimously to uphold the First Amendment right of Black Mississippians who were boycotting local businesses as a form of protest against segregation and racial inequality. These bills are the first time that we are now seeing a challenge, and they are related to the effort to shield Israel from accountability for its human rights violations. But before we can understand these laws against boycotting Israel, we have to understand the landscape of the boycott. Let's start with um, an abbreviation, BDS. How would you explain BDS? BDS stands for Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions. Established in 2005, it calls for a boycott of Israeli and international companies involved in Israel's violations of Palestinian rights. Palestinian civil society recognized that it could no longer count on countries or international bodies like the UN Security Council to take action against Israel's violations. And so it made an appeal similar to the one made by the ANC in South Africa against the apartheid regime that actually worked uh, in the late 1980s, succeeded in dismantling the apartheid regime. So as this movement grew, uh, what we saw was an effort by the Israeli government to delegitimize this movement and try to crush it through a variety of ways and means. These anti-boycott laws are in many ways the tip of the iceberg of many efforts that we have seen across Europe and across the United States to try to crush the ability of the international community to stand in solidarity with Palestinians. So they recognize that boycotts are a strategy and a tactic that has been used successfully by social justice movements historically uh, because they do allow everyday individuals to take action and they also allow the conversation to emerge. When there are groups that are organizing for particular campaigns, that's an opportunity for the issue of Israel to be brought up, for people to explain why, for example, they may be calling for the boycott of Hewlett-Packard. I am boycotting Hewlett-Packard because they are involved in the biometrics for the checkpoints. Every Palestinian has an ID card that they must have, and they delay Palestinians for many, many hours at a time. And so that's part and parcel of the occupation. And as they explain the reason to boycott Hillard Packard, they explain the occupation, they explain checkpoints, they explain the lived experience of Palestinians. And I think that has been, the, I would say, the greatest success of the movement. Um, it's really changing the conversation in the United States. And as the conversation in the United States changes, and as it becomes clear to the Israel lobby in America that they are losing that conversation, then the next effort becomes to not allow the conversation to happen in the first place. Right. And who's been advocating for these laws? And how have they been able to spread so quickly across 
the U.S. over the past few years? Uh, there's been many groups that have been involved in the effort to pass anti-boycott laws in America. There is one particular group called ALEC, which is the American Legislative Exchange Council. This isn't the state capitol. It's a resort hotel where lawmakers are wined and dined as members of the American Legislative Exchange Council, or ALEC. Literally every state has been influenced by the work of ALEC. Scores of ALEC model bills have been enacted into law throughout the country. It's come under increasing scrutiny for its role in promoting stand-your-ground gun laws, voter suppression bills, union-busting policies, and other controversial legislation. So they were instrumental in how quickly these bills were able to pass across the country because they have a very well-oiled machine with what they call model legislation. And then these model legislations are taken uh, to each state and all they need to do is add their state name to the bill. Wow. Not a lot of thinking required. Is the Israeli government involved with these laws at all? The first anti-boycott law was passed in Israel, and Israel created a ministry, the strategic ministry, to fight the BDS movement and other efforts to delegitimize Israel, as they call it. And we see it in clips like, for example, the one that we have in the film of Netanyahu speaking openly on Twitter of how they passed anti-boycott bills all around America clearly taking credit for that effort. Whoever boycotts us will themselves get boycotted. In the last few years, we have promoted in the USA, and there are now laws in most states there that anyone who boycotts Israel will themselves be punished. So it won't help them. We don't care. We are fighting it. After the break, how far will anti-boycott legislation go in the U.S.? And what hope is there for individuals and companies pushing back against this legislation? So, Julia, one of the most striking parts of your film is when you catch a Democratic state senator just by chance when you're walking with one of your interviewees in the halls of the legislature and ask him about his support for one of these bills. And he admits that he didn't really know much about it when he voted for it. Can you tell me about that moment and what went through your head when you heard it? Um, So we were in the Arkansas Senate interviewing Bart Hester, who is a Republican, who co-sponsored the anti-boycott bill. Hey, Greg, how are you? And as uh, we are walking with him after our interview with him ended, we bumped into one of his colleagues who is a Democrat. Greg, do you want to talk about boycott, divest, and sanction of Israel? Oh, oh. I don't know enough about it. I know it got me in a little trouble with a few people that I represent. Sometime last year, somebody posted something on Facebook. They had just discovered that we had done it, and I had completely forgotten about it. Wasn't even sure how I voted. Had to go back and look it up. (laughs) I wish I could tell you that I was surprised by his response. I was glad to be able to capture someone on camera admitting to it, but the reality is that In much of the country, state legislators know that if you're presented with a bill that is introduced to you as a pro-Israel bill, you vote for it. It's just one of those bills we vote a couple thousand times during a session, and it was one of those that, for whatever reason, just wasn't on my radar. That's just what happens in America. And I've heard from elected officials that to vote against the anti-boycott bill would have been political suicide. But you know what I what I what I really appreciated about that exchange was that 
they both explained how it works in a sense. They said there weren't any Palestinians who came to them to advocate against this bill before it was passed, and thus they didn't they didn't hear any opposition. So no one no one heard the other side of the argument. I doubt there was any questions. It just flew through. So it really did speak to the power of lobbying or individual lobbying, something that I personally might have dismissed before. And they're seemingly saying it might work. Um, I regret not knowing more about the issue when I voted. And knowing now, having heard from my constituents, I probably would have voted against it. I can tell you after attending many meetings and most of all watching many of these committee meetings, recordings, as these bills were being passed across the country, that there was plenty of organizing in favor of these bills. And there was not, as Senator Hester said, an opposition. That's not to excuse elected officials violating the constitutional rights of Americans. (laughs) Mm -hmm. You get elected because you are seen as the representative of all Americans, not of organized interest groups. We have seen since the film came out that this goes beyond boycotting Israel. You spoke to Lara Friedman, president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace, and she said, You may not care about Israel-Palestine, but you should care if it's being used as a hook to legislate in your states and at the federal level against free speech. How many words would I have to change in this legislation to use it to condition contracts and thereby quash free speech of anyone who, say, supports Black Lives Matter or is involved in protesting for environmental reasons? And it's like 10 words. It's a template. How have these bills set up a precedent? So when we started making the film, uh, we knew that these laws could serve as a template for attacking other social justice movements. Uh, During production, that was a hypothetical threat. Mm -hmm. By the time we were finishing the film, these laws started passing. Since the start of the year, over 40 copycat anti-boycott bills have been introduced across America. They target not only the environmental movement and the gun safety movement, but also the movement for equity and justice. They target also the LGBTQ movement Hmm. by saying you cannot boycott in the name of transgender rights. They also boycott the reproductive justice movement. So every progressive uh, efforts in America are now being targeted in conservative states in particular by using a template that was created with the passage of the anti-boycott law protecting Israel from accountability. Basically, we have opened the Pandora's box here. Julia, even with this rising tide of these boycott laws, the U.S. is still seeing more interest in supporting Palestinian rights now than ever before. How does that set up the next stage of this fight? What do you think happens next? I do want to emphasize that the reason why there are anti-boycott bills today, it's because there has been such a huge narrative shift in America over the past two decades. We saw that most clearly in the Gallup poll that has been conducted for 20 years now, asking Americans where their sympathies lie on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And this year, in 2023, for the first time, Americans who identify as Democrats sympathize more with Palestinians than they do with Israel. The pro-Israel lobby is taking notice. And the effort to pass anti-boycott bills is an effort to crush this debate and no longer let the reality that Palestinians have been living through for 75 years to become common knowledge in America and for Americans to start asking, as many young people are increasingly doing, why are we sending $3.8 billion in military aid to a country that has been oppressing a population? And so I believe that this effort now, and again, the anti-boycott laws are the tip of the iceberg. That's not the only way 
that uh, the Israel lobby tries to, in many ways, destroy people's lives if they speak against Israel in America, we are going to continue to see that. And it's going to get ugly. But I tend to believe that when we learn the truth, we don't unlearn it. And people are courageous. And historically, we have seen people stand up and want to change. And I believe, and I may be naive, that that's where we're going. And that's The Take. To see Julia's documentary, Boycott, in full, head to this episode's description. We'll pop a link to the film there. This episode was produced by Faranisa Campana with Nagin Oliayi, Zaina Bezer, Sonia Bagat, David Enders, Sari El Khalili, Chloe K. Lee, Miranda Lynn, Ashish Malhotra, Khaled Sultan, Amy Walters, and me, Malika Bilal. Alex Roldan is our sound designer. Joe Plord mixed this episode. Alexandra Locke is The Take's executive producer, and Ney Alvarez is Al Jazeera's head of audio. We'll be back. <laughs> 